Uh, today we're going to have a video lecture on one of the great poets of America, actually one of the greatest poets uh, ever in my opinion. Uh, he's a marvelous uh, player with words, uh, a great lover of life, and E.E. Uh, e. Cummings, I think, is able to really put forth a kind of uh, spectacular uh, view of how poetry can really affect us and change us and really give us a different way of thinking about things, a uh, different perspective on the world. And uh, for the early 19th, 20th century uh, American poets, this was really their goal, which was to use language, to use poetry, to uh, change people, to change their thinking, to make them see things differently and feel things differently. Um, so today, uh, in this video lecture, what we're really looking at is how E.E. E. Cummings is able to use language to transform our thinking. Um, the poem we're going to focus on is uh, Anyone Lived in a Pretty How Town. This is a famous poem. Uh, many people would know this or uh, be able to recite parts of it. Uh, it's a poem that's commonly read, and E.E. E. Cummings was a very popular poet in his time and also later. So uh, we're going to uh, look at this poem. I'll give you a little background on E.E. E. Cummings first. Uh, secondly, um, I'll read the poem for you. It's a beautiful sounding poem. Uh, the poem has great rhythm, great uh, repetition, a great feeling for the, the way uh, words work in terms of sound. And um, after that, we'll go through the poem uh, line by line. We'll try to look deeply at how the language is being used and uh, what E.E. E. Cummings is trying to do with each of his lines, each of his words, each of his phrases, right? Poetry is chosen. Uh, poetry chooses words very, very carefully. There's no accident there. Everything is put into place. Everything is structured very marvelously, uh, especially in this poem. Uh, after that, we'll look at some bigger pieces of the poem. Uh, what are the bigger meanings that he's trying to create about um, individuals and society, about uh, words and life, about seasons, about people's places? We'll look at these uh, bigger themes. And then at the very end, uh, I'll come back uh, and give you some more about the themes of the poem. The poem, I think, carries lots and lots of themes, very deep, very complicated uh, set of themes. So we want to look at those bigger themes uh, at the very end of today's video lecture. So let's get started. E.E. E. Cummings is one of the most fascinating characters in American literature. He created poems that were confusing and lovely and wonderful and just sort of amazing works of language. He is one of the most interesting characters and one of the most interesting poets uh, that America has ever produced. He, of course, like many writers in the 1920s and 30s, went to Paris, and we'll talk about that in a little while. He learned many things from painting, too. The reason he went to Paris was to learn to paint. But before we talk about his life and his ideas, let's jump in and look at a poem because it's really kind of shocking at first and uh, a kind of shocking pleasure. So let's jump in. Anyone lived in a pretty how town? Anyone lived in a pretty how town with up so floating many bells down? Spring, summer, autumn, winter. He sang his didn't, he danced his did. Women and men, both little and small, cared for anyone not at all. They sowed their isn't, they reaped their same. Sun, moon, stars, rain. Children guessed, but only a few, and down they forgot as up they grew. Autumn, winter, spring, summer, that no one loved him more by more. When by now and tree by leaf, she laughed his joy, she cried his grief. 
Bird by snow and stir by still, anyone's any was all to her. Someone's married, they're everyone's. Laughed their cryings and did their dance. Sleep, wake, hope, and then. They said their nevers, they slept their dream. Stars, rain, sun, moon. And only the snow can begin to explain how children are apt to forget to remember with up so floating many bells down. One day anyone died, I guess, and no one stooped to kiss his face. Busy folk buried them side by side, little by little and was by was, all by all and deep by deep. And more by more they dream their sleep, no one and anyone, earth by April, wish by spirit and if by yes. Women and men, both dong and ding, summer, autumn, winter, spring, reap their sowing and when there came, sun, moon, stars, rain. Well, this is a beautiful poem, but a confusing poem, almost like a joke. It's like wordplay. It's like fooling around with language. But that's what E. e. Cummings wanted to do. He was bored with the traditional way that uh, language had been used. He took off uh, for Paris to learn to paint. Here are some of his paintings. Uh, he learned to use color and touch and stroke and line and uh, shapes. Uh, to express what he wanted to express. And I think all of those things translated over to his poetry techniques. Uh, he learned to break the rules, not follow the rules, broke the rules of grammar, broke the rules of punctuation, broke the rules of uh, common speech, of compression and precision. And I think he really wanted to create a new poetic language. He wanted to express something that was just never expressed before. And his way of doing that was to use language in a really, really different and unusual and unique way. Now, let's go back to the poem a little bit. We'll look at a couple of his poems, come back a little bit to his painting. But let's jump back into the poem for a minute and try to look at it piece by piece. Uh, more by more, deep by deep, as he might say. The first line, of course, anyone lived in a pretty hot town. Anyone is usually a vague word, but here it's the name of a character. A pretty how town, well, that doesn't grammatically make sense, but we can imagine it's just an average town, a very how, very normal average town. Up so floating many bells down, well, time, we have human time, the bells. We have nature's time, spring, summer, summer, autumn, winter. He sang his didn't, he danced his did. Beautiful, right? He, that's how he lived. He sang and he danced. Uh, he sang and complained about what he didn't do, and he danced uh, when he did do things. The community that he lived in, right, all kind of different people, didn't like him. They lived how they wanted to live, they sowed, there isn't, they reaped their same, and surrounding everyone and everything is this huge immensity of the universe, sun, moon, stars, rain, right, the environment, nature around everybody uh, in this small community. Now because this is such a tricky poem, let's go back and look at the big points first, right? The first verse really gives us a person, a place, and things happening, right? Actions he's taking. The second one tells us where he lives, uh, what actions those people do, and the time. Well, time, place, actions, conflict, that's a story. So this is really a poem, which is a story about everyone, right? You and me, as well as everybody else. So what happens next? Love new character seasons, and love grows deeper, right? Uh, the 
anyone and no one are together. They're in love, right? They're laughing, they're crying. His any is her all. And the bird, snow, snow, a metaphor? I think so. We'll hear the snow a little bit later in the poem as well. So we've got a marvelous story coming together here, right? Now let's look at the next a uh, couple verses where things are starting to move forward. Of course, marriage comes in and all the promises of marriage, crying and laughing, the routine of life, sleep, waking, and hope. And uh, the average everyday life that they start to live is uh, one of a married couple. But in the next verse, we have stars, rain, sun, moon on the top, and up so floating many bells down, the time on the bottom. Uh, pinching them in somehow. And here we get the snow again. The snow, a symbol of coldness, right? Of whiteness, of purity. And we get this idea of explaining and remembering. So things start to become a little bit more complicated in their life. What are they trying to explain? What are they trying to remember? The children, of course, comes from verse 3. But here the children are starting to forget. So, a big change. Well, we know that life contains death, and in the next section, of course, anyone dies. No one dies, too, I think, soon after, and they were buried side by side, right? They were obviously in love. They didn't want to stay alive alone. She died with him. And little by little, and time by time passing, uh, everything about them is starting to be forgotten. But what is death really? Is the, is the story over? We have the only real punctuation at the end of this section, wish by spirit and if by yes, period. But is that the end? Are, are things over? I don't think so, right? In this section, he's saying bye, bye. Look at all those byes. Side by side, was by was, little by little, all by all, deep by deep, more by more, bye 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 bye. Well, I don't think that's just bye bye, but by and by, and uh, a marvelous, beautiful way to think of death. Uh, death is, of course, not pleasant to think of, but the final verse uh, here really gives a very beautiful picture of what it means to return to the earth and uh, women and men in the abstract, dong and ding, ding dong, right, of course, is the sound of bells of time moving, but that's human time. And what really is more powerful is the universe's time, the seasons changing, nature's power, summer, autumn, winter, spring, that's the time, the movement, the change of the seasons. And uh, here we have language from the Bible, reap and sow. And of course, we go where we came from. We return to become carbon, uh, oxygen, sun, moon, stars, rain. And uh, that's what we are. Where we come from, we return. So the image of returning to nature uh, after death. But let's try to look at the overall poem here, too, uh, even though the words themselves are a little small on the screen here, perhaps. Uh, all of you have the paper in front of you, but we have nine verses, and each of these does something very special, very unique, right? Four times nine is 36, 36 divided by 12. Uh, of course, you can do all the math back and forth and forth and back, but uh, it's an interesting little poem, not just because of the numbers, but because of the story it tells. There's a character in a town, seasons pass, there's actions. Number two, there's other people, there's some sort of conflict, he doesn't get along with the other people, but nature is surrounding them. Third verse, love, there's a new character, no one. Uh, verse four talks about a deeper love, so we know this is, a, this is really a love story. It's a story about humans, but where would human life be without love? Number five, that's the middle verse, uh, is about marriage and uh, living, sleep, uh, wake, hope. What else is there in life? The three big ones, right? 
uh, and saying and sleeping the dream, right? Uh, number six, of course, uh, talks again about the seasons and the changing, forgetting to remember, right? Uh, children are starting to forget, right? They're no longer children. Number seven, of course, death and time passing. But number eight really looks at death as a kind of sleep and a positive thing, right? A spirit, yes. The poem shouts out with a period, as if you didn't notice it. And finally, as we just talked about, returning to nature, becoming part of the universe once again. The poem is very, very highly structured. Uh, we see number one, number three, number eight, number nine is all talking about the seasons. The seasons, of course, keep this poem moving. The poem feels like it's in motion. It feels like it's cycling, circling around, uh, just like the seasons do, right? Here's summer again. Uh, the sun and the stars and the sun are all moving around, uh, around us, right? The sense of motion of the universe, of uh, the objects around us are constantly moving. There's no sense of slowing down. And the words of the poem give us that, right? At the end, uh, number eight, number nine, we looked at that before. Bye, 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 right? This sense of moving. Number four and number six bring in this idea of snow, which of course is also the winter. The verbs of the poem are very lively, very simple, right? This is a children's poem almost, right? There's nothing complicated in here. There's no difficult words. There's no hard things to understand. Each of the verbs in each of the sections gives us another aspect of life. And in a marvelous way, the poet, I think, is able to really condense down the experiences that we have in life. What else do we do? It's all right here. Pick something that you do in your life, shopping, well, that's not important. He's really bringing it down to the basics of human life. Laughing, crying, marrying, explaining, saying, dreaming, reaping. These are the very, very essentials of what human life is. And the connections and the verbs that are brought together are a little bit contradictory, confusing. He intentionally makes it confusing because that's how life is, right? They went there, came. What could that mean? Well, but we don't understand really what it means to come and go. We're part of the universe, but we're also very, very confused by that as well. So the verbs really give us a signal about not just what's happening in this poem, but what we ourselves are doing, what we're doing here, and how we're living, and how we're taking care of ourselves, and what kind of things do we do in our life. Anyone is us. Someone is no one, and someone, and anyone. This is everyone, right? So the poem is really giving us some huge themes. Uh, now that we've looked at uh, some of the details of how this poem works, uh, the kind of complicated uh, elements of the poem, uh, let's look at the bigger themes because this poem is really about the world, about us. And uh, the poet, uh, I think, is able to bring together huge ideas into a very, very small space, right? One of the mysteries of poetry and poetic language is how uh, just a few words are able to describe huge ideas. So let's look at some of those huge ideas, the themes of this poem. Um, first, I think, at the very center of this poem, as we saw, uh, is the theme of love, right? Uh, this is a kind of Romeo and Juliet story, which is, to say, a story about all of us, right? All of us long for love, we fall in love, we think of love as being the center of our life, and it's the center of this poem. Uh, anyone, 
lived, no one loved him, right? And the irony, of course, is the way the uh, words anyone and no one is used. But we go beyond the irony to understand that this is really a love story about two people who are kind of uh, not full of the usual details that we get if we see a movie or we read a novel. This is just anyone and no one, right? Kind of uh, unimportant people. But it's also us, right? It's us. We're, in the scheme of things, not necessarily so important. We are just anyone to most of the people, right? Think about Tokyo, right? How many people there are. Does anyone notice you? Maybe not. You're anyone. You're no one. You're someone, right? And so the poem, I think, is trying to write in a very universal way. It uses specific language, and we'll talk about the language in a minute, but it's trying to really write about universal themes, in particular love, the importance of love, how love creates meaning, love is at the center of our life. Um, and the poem also talks about all the things we do in our life, right? It's all in this poem, right? We sleep, we hope, we dream, we sing, we dance, we die. This is our life, right? These verbs, these simple verbs, these are verbs you learned in your first uh, English textbook, right? Um, these are nothing complicated in terms of language, but in terms of ideas or experience, they're very complicated, very difficult. How do we sleep? How do we dream? How do we love? How do we live, right? Um, how do we sing? What do we sing about? What do we dance about? The poem really wants us to use the language of the poem to think about us, to think about our life. That brings up, of course, uh, where we are. And the poem places us in the universe, right? Places us into a universe of, of stars and sun and moon, right? This is what surrounds us. And it also puts us into a time, spring, summer, autumn, fall. We, we get in this poem a real positioning of human existence. We live in a universe, we live in nature, we live in nature's time, and we live in nature's space. And uh, the poem wants us to understand that because it's important, right? We tend to forget where we are uh, in the universe. We tend to forget where we are in uh, time. And the poem brings us back to the realities of our life. Um, the poem, I think, also wants us to think about our identity. Who are we? The identity that we have uh, given to us by our culture, by our name, by our family, and so on and so forth, of course is important. But we maybe have another identity, which is as a human being, as, a, as an animal in the universe, as a part of nature. This is also part of our identity. And usually we think, oh, well, my name is Michael Pronko. I'm a professor at Meiji Gakum University. Yes, of course, that's important. But the poem wants us to kind of think bigger, right? To say, hey, you know, you're an animal uh, walking around on this planet doing things that other people do. Uh, other people fall in love, other people die, other people sing, other people work, other people uh, get married, other people get old. Um, and the poem connects us, I think, to other people, e even while kind of removing our ego, removing our sense of self-importance to connect us to something bigger, something more important. Uh, the way the poem does that is through language, and um, I think the poem, as you can see, is marvelously free. The idea of language is to play with language. 
language. You don't have to use a noun as a noun. Use a pronoun as a verb. Use a incomplete phrase, and people can still understand your meaning, right? Uh, the meaning is hard to get out. The meaning is more difficult than in daily language. But poetry is heightened language. It's higher language. It's playful language. It's meaningful language. And because we spend time with poetic language, we appreciate the everyday language, right? Most language we use is boring. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How's things? Good. Oh, I'm so tired today, right? This kind of boring language is, uh, I think, re-energized um, after we read poetry. We understand boring language even more. The language of this poem, of course, is moving us away, or moving us out of ourselves towards the universe, but it's also giving us a way to understand, through language, really where we are. The, the uh, language in this poem is really uh, trying to free us, to try to open us up, and to uh, not use language in the usual way we use it, but to use it in a different way, a playful way, uh, freeing way. And I think this is one of the themes of the poem as well, which is that language has the ability to really free us up, to really give us uh, an opening to the universe and to give us a, a deep understanding about ourself and our position in the world. Um, so uh, read the poem again. And as you read the poem, uh, try to get a sense of the playfulness, the fun, the sound of the music of the poem. But also take a look at these deeper themes, uh, because the themes of this poem are really powerful and really meaningful, and uh, I would also say uh, extremely beautiful.